Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Well, I wish that radio audiences could smell my breath. Because if they could, they'd smell these pink lady apple tartarts on my breath. I am so excited. It's so good. I just had a piece and I have to get another piece. And of course, it's been made to order by Chef William, who is the extraordinary chef at the Wick Theater. Now, this gentleman is a Renaissance chef. He does a lot of things. He sings. He's charismatic. <laughs> Everyone loves him. But boy, does he turn a table. I'll tell you, you. And, you know, I looked you up. You, what, you sent something to me, as a matter of fact. You sent something to me about your being on a, I think it was a YouTube video at a place where they had couples come. Correct. And I don't remember, but I saw you in all your glory. And I really <laughs> learned about you. You are very humble, though, and I very sweet and very, you're so dedicated to making food delicious and beautiful. How did that all happen, William? You know, it's William? artistic cuisine with the greatest depth of flavor. It's always been my mission. And this is what I strive to do in every endeavor. And at the Wick Theater, I really don't half-step that. So on the menu, it will simply say, artistic cuisine with the greatest depth of flavor. And with my signature, I insist that that be printed on all the menus. Okay, but now you're at a theater. Now, when you first, you know, let's face it, theaters, most theaters, other than the, the theaters that didn't last that long, which were dinner theaters, never had very good food, but this is a theater theater. And all of a sudden, in the extra room, which I thought was just going to be like a little um, sandwich tart something here when she first opened, has turned into the finest restaurant in in um, at least Boca, if not even more. And tell us how that all happened. Well, you know, Mrs. Wick is quite a visionary. And... She met me through a, a former colleague, and we decided that we would do something extraordinary or not do it at all. And we were familiar with the old dinner theaters that didn't serve very good food. And I said to her, I really would like to do something extraordinary that's, that economically makes sense, but also that everyone can go to. So they don't have to have tickets to see a show to have dinner. But I mean, we do pre-theater offerings from 5 and 5.30, because curtain's at 7.30 now. Maybe in season she'll change to 8 o'clock, which I'm hoping that she'll acquiesce to doing. But we also do a late-night supper, which is 7.30 and 8 o'clock, and it's becoming very popular. How many people can you actually seat comfortably? What, 60 to 70. But so we it's keep reservations. It at 60. It's reservations only, in fact. Okay. Now, if someone wants to walk in and have dinner, we have space available, sure, but there's no guarantees. Let me give a phone number because I, you're going to want to go there, whether you want to go. We want you to go to the theater because I can talk very, very strongly about the theater. Uh, but I also want you to go there for food because Chef William is a extraordinary chef besides being a fantastic uh, young man. Um, I know he loves that young man. Anyway, the phone number to call is 561-995-2333. 561-995-2333. And Marilyn Wick is as extraordinary a woman as he is an extraordinary chef. So we want you to go to see their theater. Their theater, it's only they've only been there two years doing the most amazing theater that you're going to see here in South Florida. And I mean that. The costumes, when that curtain goes up, everyone, you should, I should take a picture of everybody's mouth as it opens. And, and then, then you want to go into the restaurant and see everyone's mouth opening for your food. <laughs> so I'm moving back to you to the food. Now, I know that Marilyn did buy a lot of things from Tavern in the Green in Central Park when it fell apart. That's correct. Right? She bought at auction the original chandelier. That actually hung in the restaurant, which is quite the centerpiece of the room. And so you call it Tavern on the Green it's, now? The, the, yes. We, well, we call it the Tavern at the Wick. Tavern at the Wick. Yeah. It's not quite the same, but you have the wallpaper and murals are stunning, and they pay attribute to, to uh, pay homage, certainly, to the Tavern on the Green in New York. Okay. Now, let's just talk, talk about your background. Let's start... Sure. When you were two years old, what were you uh -huh. doing? What was in your bottle? <laughs> <laughs> or your mom's Probably breast. some red or white wine. <laughs> uh, 
I was born in the south of France. I was born in Orléans, which is about an hour south of of uh, Paris. And then my father was in the military. Uh, my mother was in, in a horse town. My grandmother was there. And my aunt Marie Claire, God rest them, and uh, my mon oncle Pierce. So we ate very well. In my earliest memories, I remember just eating beautifully. And even as at, I guess, six years old, seven years old, I was dressing for dinner. So it kept us together as a family. Now, of course, we came to the States when I was nine, eight and a half, nine years old. And my father was relocated. So we went to North Carolina. They had a little farm, 40 acres. So we farmed and did things like that. Then they moved to Peonian Springs, Virginia, which is now quite the place. It's the suburbs. It's a very desirable place and close to Middleburg and horse country. It's absolutely breathtaking. It's like the last Brigadoon left in the country. So when did you know that getting in the kitchen and mixing things with spoons was really what you love more than mud pies? When, you know, you're so funny and, and God love you for saying it because I made patachou or eclairs when I was six years old. And my Great Aunt Marie Claire and my grandmother, Beatrice, used to make me use a wood spoon, which is the only way to do it. And I laugh at people using whips or machines today because the only way to get a good eclair or patachou, and the chefs will know it, is by using a wood spoon. And you just kick the air out of it for five or ten minutes. It keeps you in shape, too, by the way. (laughs) But I knew I just fell in love with food and everyone's face at the table when they went, oh, my God, this is so good. And that's how I felt. And so... I, I realize there's an old saying, bien manger, c'est bien vivre. That's the French term, to eat well is to live well. So that's been my motto all my life. All right, so, so now, did you go to a regular school, though? I mean, did your parents recognize this in you? They did, and I, I went to regular schools, I guess you would say. I mean, I excelled pretty well. I aced the French class, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was the one of two students in French 5, AP French. It was ridiculous, but... It, I had a good time nonetheless and have a good relationship with my teachers. I knew I loved to cook and and that's what I wanted to do. And so I worked in restaurants. Even when I was 11 years old, you're not supposed to. But I I worked in little pantries and I worked at the Village Inn. And that became my first restaurant. I called it La Fleur de Lys. And at age, my God, I came full circle. I bought it. And I sold my coin collection. And I borrowed from Jack to pay Jill. And I did everything I could. And that was in 1998, and we opened to rave reviews, even from the Washington Post food critic. I was a young 27 years old with my first restaurant, and I was so lucky. But wait, so you never really went to a, a, a school no, for cooking? I worked for Francois Herringer, the late Francois Herringer, God rest him, uh, and he passed away at 91, but he was a three-star Michelin chef. And so when you're a three-star Michelin chef, it's like a brain surgeon here. So it taught me a lot, and I, I met a lot of interesting people. So I used to judge market baskets at culinary schools. I would attend classes and seminars, but they invited me to be an adjudicator. And so that's what I was. I was able to recruit nice young talent to work with me. And quite frankly, I fostered a lot of people in the kitchen. But no no major degrees except okay. for Cornell. Oh, okay, but no, no. But you worked under the tutelage of a very famous people who really knew what they were Incredible. doing. Incredible, yes. And you had that natural talent. So that's, yes. that's the yes. most important thing. So, okay, now you're, you're buying up a restaurant. And I guess my, really question, my big question is this. You're a very talented man. I don't know how you got to sing. Did you take voice lessons? <laughs> I did. See, I could tell. <laughs> did you want to be a simultaneously when you cook at night in the daytime, you want to be a singer? I've always been work? fascinated with theater. It's true. And so when I was... I bought my first house when I was 20 years old. I had a mortgage. All my friends were out partying all night, and I had a $1,700 a month mortgage. And so that's enough to strap any late blooming teenager. So I used to moonlight, and I I auditioned for the Washington Opera, and I I got the role, and I got the part. So I was a chorister for about four years. But you never had voice lessons? I had voice lessons from one particular singer, and she was wonderful. I did it for about 30 days, and then after that, I just did it on my own. So you knew right that in. you had a talent because your voice it was a baritone, no? Absolutely. It's a baritone bass. Baritone right in bass. between, yes. So you love that. So that was something that you did on the side, but actually... It didn't foot- pay the bills, no. but it helped. <laughs> but, but being a chef, it's a little treacherous. Being a chef is very consuming. I have a consuming passion for excellence, so... I have this strange affection for food. 
And everyone know, that knows me knows it. And so I guess I try to rub off on other people. But if you, if you have the occasion to work with me in the kitchen... I'm warning you. I'm pretty passionate, oh, so I, I really I, want I, it done right the first to that time. Sometime. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. So, right. if I said to you, I mean, you see these uh, cooking shows. If I said everyone's going to make a cheese sandwich, a, a grilled uh-huh. cheese sandwich, all right? Uh-huh. You would be able to take what we would think of. You slap some cheese on some bread with some butter on the outside. You make it brown. Maybe you put a little piece of bacon. No, no, no. You no. would now, I can tell, you would add herbs and you would, I would cut the bread the like a flower. Cook monsieur without the ham, you know, and make it something like that little bechamel sauce or Mornay sauce, you know, something like that. Really good thick slices of bread. If I had brioche, I'd use that, <laughs> which I normally have all the time because I make it every day, really. At least five days a week I make brioche. So you really can take something, and you said this before, that... It's not just the food. It's the way it looks, the way it tastes. Absolutely. You, you watch people. That's uh, right. It's, it's almost a little embarrassing eyes, to watch, so. you watch them. <laughs> when I eat, I'm going to hide my mouth. <laughs> you're going to watch me eat. But you did watch me eat with that fantastic, uh, beautiful apple. My, my, Good. My, um, red, my lady. I've, 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 I lost it's the word. It's a pink lady apple. Pink lady. Ta-ta. Pink lady. It's, a, it's an apple top. Uh, uh, a French classic. Well, first of all, it looked, when I first said, uh, there's a pizza out there because it's this big round thing. Sure, sure. And I got closer and I smelled something that was fantastic. And then I can hardly tell you, other than the apples, I don't even know what else is in there. How, all right, let's take that, for example. Okay. Start that with us. How, how would you even start that? Well, I use something called pot sucre or sweet pie dough. You could find that recipe probably in the Julia Child's The Way to Cook or, or from La Russe Gastronomique. But I take a good sweet pie dough. In this case, I made shortbread. And I roll the shortbread out and I press it into a tart pan. And then I take the apples and I pare them carefully and I caramelize them. And after I caramelize them, I let them cool off and I fan them out with a knife and layer them all over the dough that I've already pressed in. And I use sultanas, or the golden raisins, rather. And then I make a custard. And I make a custard with calvados, eggs and a little cream, and a little vanilla. And then I just cover that nice and pat it down. And then I change it and I bake it for 35 minutes. And then I make a fondant, which is a honey glazed fondant on the top with almonds. And then I reduce the fondant or the fondo uh, until it's uh, the, a thick consistency or coat the back of a spoon. Then I cover the top of it and I put it back in the oven to glaze. So it's like a warm honey glazed apple tout. And uh, it's really good as is or with ice cream and butterscotch. Oh, my goodness. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. All right, so now that, that is what a pastry chef would make. But you Absolutely. are a chef for all seasons. You make, whether it's soup or, or the sure. main, the entrees sure. or the salads... Yeah. Is it unusual for someone to be so good at all of it? Well, I guess I'm fortunate to have worked with so many skilled and talented people so many years of my life. This is all I've ever done is cook, really, with this, save the fact that I worked. Uh, I, I didn't really work. I sung uh, for the Washington Opera Chorus for about four years of my life, but I've always worked in a kitchen. Ever since I've been 11 years old, I'm not kidding. I've been gainfully employed in a kitchen somewhere. So, so of all the food that you make, and I know people have asked you, what is your favorite food? Or what, what is it that you would be um, overjoyed to teach me to make? I, <laughs> I think salmon en croûte. Or in French, it would be le saumon dans sa robe croustillante. Or just a fresh salmon, and we would roll pastry, light pastry, and fill the salmon with like spinach and mushrooms and lobster mousse and crab or whatever is available here, stone crabs in the season, something that's indigenous to the area, and then wrap that in pastry and shape it like a fish. It is so good, baked and sliced, and you do it for dinner parties as a main course. I'm doing it for a special dinner next week in the dining room because it's on special request, but that's one of my most favorite things to make of all time. It's, um, you're almost like an uh, interior designer, <laughs> but interior of the food. I mean, you... You, Maybe a food stylist. A I don't food know. stylist. Maybe. You look no. at everything, uh, yeah. but you see, you're sure that's going to taste good. That that's a given. I already know I can you know. taste it when I talk about it. It's you funny. can. I've been doing it all my life, so I know what it's going to taste like already. 
and and you, so you have to smell that what you're buying is proper. Absolutely. The fish, the, the, I'm so particular. So where yeah. do you do that now? Let's say do you do that early in the morning. You have to go I do, and buy and your I'll food. I do, and I'll tell you, I found the finest purveyors ever down here. I've been fortunate enough to have befriended some owners of companies. The freshest fish, period, anywhere is Port Royal in Miami. I mean, they have their own boats. They bring in the catch. You know what's going to be available. You get an email the day before on the day of. And then they bring And it I up. get really day boat scallops, day boat fish. It's unbelievably good. Now, I mentioned salmon to you, and I only get salmon flown in from Scotland. I'm that picky because the waters Scotland? are so clean. Scottish flown salmon. Flown in? It's called Loch Duart salmon, and it's amazing. It's full fat, the good kind. You know, it lowers your cholesterol and... You won't need to take fish oil if you eat that every day. <laughs> a little salmon incorporated into your diet is so healthy. That's why I like salmon so much, smoked or anyway. I do my own version of a of a smoked. I'll do a half smoked salmon and things like that. So is that why when we go to Europe, they don't fill the plates very full? No, they. Eat, they well, I think in Europe they have a, a sensible breakfast, a large midday meal, and then a lighter dinner. No, no, but it's when we like go, a, they don't. The do restaurants mean? do not fill your plates the way they do here. Well, they probably eat less. Less is more. I, I think we expect so much here that people want to take home things from a restaurant, and I, I think that's a little tacky. But you know, you want a big bang for your buck, and it's understood. Some people eat more than others. I try to be sensible when I give things, but I love vegetables so much. So, if there's anything I'm guilty of, is having a whole. I call it bouquet du chef. Whatever I have fresh, so if I if I have, you know, braised leeks, wild mushrooms, little turnips, or if I found some beets at Bedner's Farm that I liked, I will dig them up and cook them and prepare them, and everything will be on the plate. So I will just go, oh, my goodness, this looks like a vegetable platter. But people like it very much. Yes, so. and <laughs> vegetables, of course, we knew, we know it are, that's the healthiest thing we can eat, but unless it's cooked properly, for instance, someone... I don't eat much kale. I've now learned right. how to eat kale in a salad because I don't right. like it. But someone right. went to a lot of trouble. And they said, oh, I made the most wonderful kale, and they brought it to me. After she left, they put it in the garbage. I can't, <laughs> I can't eat kale, but if, I, no, if you, you made kale, well, I'm sure it would taste different. I, I will try to, again, just come up with something like uh, kale. The, the, I would try to extract all the flavor from the kale, be it cooked with a little country ham, be it cooked with turnips or... Potatoes, new potatoes out of the garden. I would like it very much because I love kale. You uh, love kale. For you. I do. Kale Caesar is certainly a hot item now. Um, and you see it at all the grocery stores or Whole Foods or Fresh Foods or, or something like that, that they have kale in every variety and baby kale and things like that. I, mean, I it's know. And I, I don't know why. Why am I not? Well, kale does have a bitter taste. So you have to do something to bring out the... I do, right? yeah. I use a little cider vinegar when I, if I'm going to cook kale or we'll saute it, I, I use shallots and a little olive oil and maybe a little pat of butter. Depends on what I'm feeling, but generally olive oil with the shallots. And then I will add the kale to the pan, maybe a little stock and a little water and a little splash of wine. Oh, okay. So and now, let it simmer. Oh, so and now it really imparts a, a different flavor to the kale and it's really good for you. Sort of drink it. And I guess the old fashioned way they would call it pot liquor. Pot liquor, yeah, and you sort of drink that in a little broth, and it's really wonderful, especially when you put new potatoes in it. <laughs> okay, see, already, we're talking about kale. Now, now we're, we're passionate about <laughs> kale now. <laughs> right. Okay, so but, my guest is Chef William, who is such a delight. He, he's, I mean, I've had people on this show, and I've, I, who are really fantastic, but something about him, he has these eyes that glow, glisten when he talks about food, when he talks about anything. Um, I have this great picture of you now. I'm going to okay. put in Boomer Times. Okay. And, right. um, and I think that the secret to your success, besides being experienced, you've been a chef all your life, you love food, and the passion just oozes out like that, like this, like the, the, the tart, <laughs> excuse me, that I'm eating. And, the, and I, I mean, I can hardly think straight with all this food, this gorgeous, gorgeous apple tart. Green, is it's the... It's the lady. What's it called? The lady? Yeah, the pink lady apples. It's pink the last lady. of the season. I had a bushel that I bought about two weeks ago. It was the last of them. 
And I bought them up all as many as I could, and I called, and I said, send me whatever you have left, and they gave them to me. So they've been in the refrigerator, and quite frankly, they are still flavorful and delicious. Those are my favorite apples. Next to, I admit, I love honey crisp apples. And if I had to choose between the two, of course, they're both seasonal, and I can't. Pink Lady Apple's only around for a few weeks, Honey Crisp for a couple of months, and that's it. I think... Everything else is generic. I think there's a book in you. <laughs> Maybe. There's a I book. I don't know. No, no, there's a book. I, there's Maybe absolutely a book. Oh, my goodness, is there a book in you? Because you could say all these wonderful things in that book. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what's so nice. It's not just a recipe book. It's how you look at every every single sure. thing. sure. And, you know, you came here and we did want to talk a little bit about the Wick Theater, of course, because that's why people are going to your restaurant. They they first heard about the Wick Theater and then they wound up going into the restaurant. Sure. I'm very excited. Saturday night I'm going to see Peter Pan. And this has been on Broadway for many, many years. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what's happening there? You know, the show, what I've seen on the stage is going to be absolutely extraordinary. And since Mrs. Wick's goal is to bring Broadway to Boca, she means it. I'm not kidding. And the costumes and the the staging is absolutely stunning. It should be a real feat to see this show. Now, I get to see a little preview tomorrow, which I'm thrilled about. Now, it's not a it. children's show specifically, it's is really it? It's really a family show, but it's very kid-friendly. But they'll be flying, and there's rigs there. They, she's had specialists from California from New York to do the staging, and certainly Shannon Mills is the star, who was Kathy Rigby's understudy, who did the role for years, we all know, after the Olympics. She was Peter Pan for maybe a decade or two. I don't know how long. But uh, Shannon is, is rather amazing. I've had the good fortune to interact with her, and she certainly takes the cast by their hand and leads everyone, and she's amazing and flies all over the place. <laughs> and She makes a wonderful and, Peter Pan. And, and, and you know... Are you going to make a Peter Pan dinner? Well, the menu is certainly geared towards the show. So there's all sorts of, there's a Peter Pan entree, and there's a Peter Pan cocktail. There's Captain Hook's favorite, and there's even alligator this time, featured on the menu for the first time ever. But there is a crocodile on the show. <laughs> and being indigenous to Florida. Excuse me, you mean something that, that that's not a real crocodile. No, no, but there's, well, there's a crocodile on okay, the show. Okay. But, I mean, you know, it's not a real one, but there is. Well, it's not just like her to bring up well, a crocodile. I think Captain Hook jumps in and feeds himself to the crocodile at the end of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, Much are we to gonna, so we're eating in the dining room. Are we going to have some, our desserts coming down from the above, flying no. onto our uh, dishes? No, not quite. That's okay. Well, they're going to be wonderful. I'm going to do a trifle this time with wonderful Genoise cake and then... Uh, a few other delights, which is going to be wonderful, and uh, I'm looking forward to it immensely. Uh, we have some very special guests coming. In fact, everyone is a special guest in my dining room. I know they are. They are. Everyone is treated the same there, which and, is important. And it must be very difficult for you to be able to decide, okay, what's next on our menu? I mean... How do you plan your menus? Because you love everything. How do you, you know, you have <laughs> It's so easy for to... me to come up with something. You know, it's funny, but I think about it. And the thing about the theater, you know, they, they want to have something that's catchy, uh, that goes with the current show. And I don't mind them putting twists on, you know, real classic French cuisine. I sort of giggle about it. And it is sort of cutesy. I, I don't mind it a bit. And I think people get a kick out of it. Um, also, I, I need to mention that we've just hired a fantastic new maitre d'. And I'm sure the service will be extraordinary. And that's so important to me because good good service makes the food taste better. You're right. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad you said it's, that. I'm, it's so important to me as a chef or restaurateur that we have impeccable service. Because, really. you know, and I don't want to blame the French, but every time I've been to a French restaurant, they are, they're not that they're nasty, but they're certainly not too friendly. No. And no, what and is th- that about that? That is a fault. It's this holier-than-thou attitude that I don't like. Uh, and unfortunately, it's some of my relatives are like that, but they can't help it. It's the way they were born. <laughs> but I rise above it. But I understand the sort of aristocratic view that's sometimes a little pretentious that I don't like. But we're warm, uh, friendly, polished, yet unfamiliar service. And that's really the motto there. So, so how long should a nice dinner take uh, for you, number one, to prepare, and number two, to dine, to eat? 
The entire experience should be about an hour, 45 minutes to two hours for a couple. If it goes any faster than that, I don't think they're having the experience that I really want them to have. Now, some people are admittedly in a hurry, and let's face it, we're in Boca Raton. Some people are very demanding and want to know what you get with a platter. But you know, for me as a chef, I really want it to go on for a couple of hours. Now, if people come in at 5 o'clock or 5.30, the curtain's at 7.30, so it's perfect timing. There's no rush. It's a nice pre-theater menu. If you want to come in for 7.30, 8 o'clock late night supper, stay as long as you like. I won't pick up the main course until I'm cued by the server. They're my liaison. And I get a chance to really uh, visit the dining room more often than during the late night seatings. And, and, and I have everyone. no idea how you as a chef can decide... <laughs> how to hold off food. Well, how I'm, do you do that? Well, I'm I pretty mean, picky. I make them communicate with me on a regular basis. But I mean, how? But so if you're making something and it's yes. fresh, right? And you just wait until they say, okay, then you make it real fast. I, how are you right, doing I this? I have to time it correctly, you know, and especially with this menu because I'm doing real prime rib of beef. I, I bought Allen Brothers prime beef, so it's real prime. And Unlike a lot of places, I'm very picky. It's going to melt in your mouth. It's going to be wonderful. I'm doing that. I'm doing incredible scallops. Diver scallops on a plank, <laughs> which are wonderful. These scallops are so fresh. They're coming tomorrow morning. They were just shucked uh, probably an hour ago. I just got off the phone with John Halco, one of the partners of Port Royal. And, and then where do where they figure. put them? They put them in water? No, they put yeah. them in a muslin. These are true dry scallops. They put them in a muslin cloth, like a cheesecloth, and bring them to me just like that. And they're the sweetest things out of the sea. They're just like sugar. It's amazing. But they don't, they don't require much cooking, do they? I like them rarish. A lot of people want them cooked longer. I think it ruins the texture <coughs> and the silkiness. Uh, but I love scallops. <coughs> and, and quite frankly, I'll, I'll serve them beautifully. Impeccably, you should try them if you're coming. Oh, you're coming. absolutely. No, th- now I, I know that people are, we're going to have to, you know, we're out of time. We could do this for five hours. We're out of time. <laughs> so I hope I've convinced you to go there and to, to dine at the Wick, the tavern. <clears throat> but go see Peter Pan. The number there again is 561-995-2333. That's 561-995-2333. I am your slave. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I love I think you're wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you it's so much. It's a pleasure. Much.